Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Roleplay Chat. I'm Matt, a game master who cannot stop talking about roleplaying games. In this week's episode of Roleplay Chat, we're going to be talking about making terrain and integrating it into your game. I'm joined by Rachel, a YouTuber who does all kinds of amazing terrain making. In our conversation, we cover topics that are suitable for people who have experience with terrain making and also for people who are new to the hobby or who maybe have never crafted before. We cover things like building your own terrain, the types of tools you might want to use or need, and also integrating that terrain and using it into your game so that you can make the most of it. Before we get to today's conversation, I wanted to remind the listeners of the show that if you want more Roleplay Chat in your life, you can subscribe to the Roleplay Chat Patreon. On the Patreon, all subscribers get access to a special extended edition of the episode where me and the guest talk for an additional 15 to 30 minutes about preparing games, running games, and sharing strategies and advice. So if you want more roleplay chat in your life, that is a fantastic way to do so and also support me in making this content for you. All right, so with that said and done, let's dive into the conversation. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Roleplay Chat. I'm Matt, a game master who can't stop talking about roleplaying games. I am so excited for you all to listen to today's episode. We're going to be talking about terrain in tabletop roleplaying games. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. I do a lot of terrain crafting and I'm humbled to be joined today by a new and growing voice in the tabletop RPG terrain making space. She is a content creator, an artist, a crafter, and you may already know her from her terrain building videos on YouTube. Her name is Rachel, and her YouTube channel is Rachel Does Wonders. Welcome, Rachel, to Roleplay Chat. I'm so excited to have you here today. Hello and welcome. Me too. I'm super <laughs> stoked to be talking about terrain with you. Cool, cool. Yeah, let's let's do it. Um, before we do that, though, Rachel, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to say hello to the listeners and let them know a little bit about yourself. So why don't you give us a very quick kind of origin story of your YouTube channel and let us know where we can subscribe to your amazing YouTube content. Yeah, um, I, I have just started making terrain specific YouTube videos uh, in the past few months. Um, but leading up to that, origin story-wise, I grew up playing video games. Uh, Super NES was my first system. <laughs> nice. um, and then uh, that slowly progressed uh, more socially to board games. Catan launched me into the world of more complex stuff. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons has been my favorite uh, TTRPG, and I was introduced to that about five years ago. But really, my YouTube has culminated from uh, the little version of me that would make home videos, uh, integrating nice. elements of fantasy from the video games that I played and writing stories to fit in those worlds, uh, and my love of crafting and art. And so uh, d and has opened up this world of making useful crafts <laughs> 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 and then um and then making videos to show others uh, how to make them as well and if i can add a fun and entertaining flair then uh then uh, yeah i love I've, I've been loving what i'm doing so far so uh you can find me uh my handle is rachel r-a-e-c-h-e-l does d-o-e-s all one word and that's my handle for everything from youtube uh to instagram um, I just launched a Patreon as well. Um, <laughs> that's not how I spell my real name, but my real name, R-A-C-H-E-L, is taken for everything under the sun. So, <laughs> so why, not, why not add a bit of a fantastical flair with an apostrophe in there? Yeah, um, it feels yeah. very fey. It feels very like creatures of the fey wild, kind of. You yeah, know? Like yeah. It. Like it. it makes it a little bit harder to find, but hey, um, my, my handle doesn't have it, so... <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, Rachel, I'm I'm really excited to have you here to talk about terrain because that's something that I love doing for my table. I don't 
really get the opportunity to bring it out as often as I'd like to, and I'm slowly building up kind of a big catalog of terrain pieces. But uh, I, I think regardless of how big of a catalog you have for your terrain, it adds such an interesting dimension to a role-playing game, especially when you're sitting around a table and you pull out a cool statue or you pull out some stone columns or whatever it is that you're, that you're using at your table. Seeing that wonder in your player's eyes of adding this dimension to the game is so worth it. So I'm really excited to talk to you today, and I'm really excited to try and convert some listeners uh, into the beautiful hobby of terrain crafting. Yes. Um, so, yes, I know. I, I've got a lot of people out there on Twitter telling me, like, no, theater of the mind, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing that people like more than arguing their side, so we'll, we'll argue ours today. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly, exactly. So, so today, listeners, we're hoping to cover kind of three uh, main topics of conversation. The first is going to be the benefits of using terrain. And of course, you know, we're not here, if you're one of those theater of the mind diehards, we're not here to point fingers, but we're here to tell you the benefits uh, of using terrain in your game. And maybe there's some things that you hadn't considered uh, and, and you could maybe convince yourself to give it a try. The, the next main category for today's conversation is going to be making terrain and kind of getting started and how to do it. And then finally, we're going to wrap up the conversation with just how to use terrain in your games. So there's some tips and tricks out there for sure to kind of make it as smooth of a transition as possible. I think now is our chance to try and influence or impact people who maybe don't believe in using terrain at their table. So we're going to try and uh, showcase the beauty of terrain and convince people listening why they should be using terrain. Uh, so the first question I have for you, Rachel, is, and here we'll give a little caveat as as I did earlier. I know not everybody likes to play their games with terrain. In fact, I know that a lot of people like and prefer playing their games theater of the mind. You know, it's something that people stand behind very fervently that theater of the mind is perhaps the, their preferred way of playing the game and they don't want to deal with terrain. I think each method has their pros and cons. I, for one, prefer using terrain. I prefer playing in person to playing online. Uh, and I prefer having visual representations of my space. So if we were here to try and convince people to use terrain, and of course, I'm not here to harsh anyone's fun. If, if your fun is theater of the mind, that's cool for you. Um, but if we were trying to convince people and maybe convert a few people into the hobby of creating their own terrain pieces for their games, what would you say to those people and what kind of benefits do you think really having a piece of terrain on your table has on your game? I would say terrain or diet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, done. We can... Episodes <laughs> over. It. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, well, first of all, uh, yeah, I totally agree um, that you can forever argue both sides, uh, theater of mind, combat versus using terrain. So yeah, I'm definitely not here to knock either method. Um, I also prefer using terrain um, because I, I found that um, I found that in my games, um, whether we're using, uh, in, in, terrain is a broad scope. Um, mm -hmm. As far as like visual representation goes, you can use battle mats, you can, um, you know, with the terrain drawn on with a couple of scatter terrain pieces, you can have three printed tiles um, or crafted terrain. But whatever you choose to use, I think having that physical representation of the battle in front of you can really help visualize the encounter, um, which I think makes the games uh, really friendly to newcomers. Um, it makes it really beginner friendly um, to, to see what's going on for your character uh, in, in relationship to everyone else. Um, and I think because yeah. because there are a lot of rules to a lot of these, a lot of TTRPGs. Um, and I think it can be difficult to understand what your character can do while also trying to imagine the battlefield in a way that matches what the DM is imagining and then try to convey it all verbally. So um, that's that's kind of my roundabout way of saying that I think terrain just makes games more beginner friendly. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I would even say, Rachel, personally, I think terrain makes any game more friendly. Like being able to visually see a space in front of you 
it doesn't even it doesn't hinder the fact that you can also have a really really good description of that space being given to you by the game master you know these things aren't mutually exclusive i i do know that some arguments that that i've heard in favor of theater of the mind often say yeah but if i see terrain there my imagination uh stops my imagination like doesn't try to fill in the blanks because i see the column in front of me i don't i don't get to like imagine a sconce on it because there's no sconce on your on your piece of terrain but i would argue that that's not necessarily the case you also mentioned something pretty interesting rachel that reminded me of something that uh mappy uh, eric from maps and quest was on the show not too long ago talking about the battle maps that he makes like he draws these really really beautiful battle maps they're really big in scale and i think he mentioned something similar to what you just said about how having a really big battle map allows your player characters to make important decisions about where they're going to be on like in the combat you know if if everything's in theater of the mind it's hard to imagine the importance the distances have on like a longbow's range a longbow in dnd fifth edition has an incredibly long range so if all your combat is happening in dark corridors in your head that longbow is always going to hit you're never forcing that player to make like a critical decision about where they're going to be. Are they going to hide? Are they going to like climb away and far to be able to pick off enemies in the back line while keeping themselves safe? Things like that. And I think the beauty of it too. I'm sorry, Rachel. I, if you have stuff to add, please interrupt me. Yeah. Oh, no. I was going to like uh, to continue on to your point. I think there's a reason why Wargaming Warhammer is is purely based on having physical representations of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. It's to encourage strategy. It's to encourage uh, the dynamics of battle in real time and understanding um, not just what is available to you, but what your character can do and where they need to be to do it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that's really important in being able to lay out the whole scene all at once so you can make critical decisions like that. Yeah, that's super, that's super interesting. And I, I never made the connection actually with Wargaming, but y you're right. And I think it adds a, a layer of like line of sight too, right? It, when you draw something out on a battle map, sure, you can say that like there's a column there and you probably can't shoot through it. But when you have like a physical representation of the actual column to scale of the space that they're fighting in, you can see if you have line of sight. You you know that if you climb up that hill, you might be able to shoot your magic missile over the column and still hit the thing on the other side. So st stuff like that. Like I think it adds this really fun layer, this really fun dimension that it brings it into the third dimension. Ooh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I find <clears throat> as a benefit for myself as a DM that, <clears throat> sorry, having the battlefield in front of me because there's so much as a DM that I'm trying to manage in terms mm. of the NPCs and uh, initiative order. Uh, what are all the, what are the, all the enemies going to be doing? And so to have it, visually in front of me helps me to be more creative with what the enemies can and will do on this battlefield that I see in front of me. Um, and yeah, it, like I think one of the trade-offs that people uh, who prefer theater of the mind argue for not using terrain is, yeah, when you limit that scope of imagination, it's because I think sometimes when people use terrain, they replace the physicality of the terrain with verbal descriptions of it mm -hmm. like the terrain in front of you is a representation of the battlefield but it still lives in your mind um and i think that that's super important to be able to use both where i can visually feast on what's in front of me and also still imaginatively absorb the words that you're giving me of what's in front so i can make decisions in my mind of what looks cool um mm -hmm. what my character can do and see it on the battlefield happening yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that maybe when we talk about using terrain, there can be stuff that we add in that context. But I agree with you 1 million percent. Like, just because there is rolling green hills with a couple of trees and rocks scattered about doesn't mean that there might not be a beehive hiding in one of those trees. You know, if a player wants to imagine something and will it into existence, 
having that conversation with your game master and rolling a die to decide whether or not there's there's like a raccoon sleeping in a tree that you can scare <laughs> and make that be part of the encounter why not like no one's gonna have a raccoon minifigure i mean i'm sure there's someone out there if you have a <laughs> raccoon minifigure please come find me and tell me where you got it but <laughs> but yeah allowing your imagination to use that springboard use the terrain as a springboard for your imagination i think could only take you further up you know what i mean it mm -hmm. it, it only helps Mm -hmm. um, yeah 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 I, I ran a poll actually rachel about about this and i wanted to know what was the thing that people like what was the thing keeping people from using terrain the most and i just i i only had the forethought of making this poll exist about 25 30 minutes ago so it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't have very many people who answered it but we have about 50 people who responded and 45 Forty-five percent of those people, their response was that they just flat out prefer theater of the mind. Um, other people mentioned it's kind of a tie for second place. Is that they prefer playing virtually and would rather just be in front of a computer instead of having a, 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 a physical space. And then the other, the other, you know, twenty-five percent of people said that they just weren't crafters. They didn't consider themselves to have the skills needed to to do terrain so hopefully after today's episode they'll have those skills they'll, they'll be able to at least try something out um but there was one thing that somebody mentioned that i thought was a uh, pretty interesting and it was it was over on mastodon and they mentioned that when they use terrain they feel like it sets a level of expectation that could be hard to meet the next time and the next time and like constantly having this need to one up themselves mm. and i i was wondering if that kind of spurs anything in in your head about you know should that be a barrier to entry for using terrain or is there a way to kind of go around that yeah um i think that <laughs> um, I, I come from a background of being plagued by perfectionism. So <laughs> I totally get that level of expectation that you might have in your own mind about, okay, well, this is what I did this time, but how am I going to up that? Like, how am I going to, well, the reaction that I got from them is going to be diluted if I just use the same stuff over and over again. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And what I, what I say to that is, um, one, that your players are not going to have that same thought in their minds <laughs> that that entirely lives with the crafter uh, um, and it doesn't need to um, the the second thing i'll say is with using terrain especially um, if you are making your terrain chances are you are going to naturally have that inspiration to want to explore and to make different pieces that serve your game um, and you're already gonna like again the terrain serves the purpose of the game it, it can be the star of the show sometimes and that's what makes it special is when you mm. use terrain in a way to indicate that hey this is a special battle that's where it can really shine um and i i, I think we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more too but um i think that you can use it in times where it serves you and you don't have to use it when it doesn't. And that's what makes it special. It's, it's not just the fact that you can do it. It's how you choose to do it. And you can choose at what level suits your party and suits you as a crafter. I really like that answer, Rachel. And, and I'll say, too, to that same point, when you build these things and choose to use these things, I think that... You know, you can choose to improve upon them and it only becomes easier for you to do that. I made this little tent that I use every single time, not every single time, almost every <laughs> single time my players are on the road and they, then they, go, to, they go to sleep. Mm. Even if I don't have a battle map out, even if I don't have anything out, I pull out this little tent that's made out of popsicle sticks and like paper towel. <laughs> and it's so obviously used, like, I'm so obviously using paper towel. You can see, like, those little, like, divots that, like, a paper towel will have. And I built that thing ages ago. It stands the test of time. And it doesn't look great. But 
the players don't expect it to look any different every time. And it kind of like creates this Pavlovian of effect of like, oh, it comes out. It's time for like us to do the campfire chatter. And it kind of triggers, it, it kind of triggers this expectation for the players. So like you're saying, I think this idea of always needing to one up ourselves lives in our own, like in our own mind. Your players are not going to be upset that you're using a little tent that looks pretty bad, but it still gets the, <laughs> the idea across. Yeah, um, and what, what, you know what will I mean? evolve is the way that you use it, like your description of the scene, um, the the different enemies that are on the scene, um, the different arrangement. Like, yes, it some of it's going to be the same terrain, but you're going to use it differently. And that's the part that's going to be energizing, invigorating, exciting. And also, mm -hmm. like, keep in mind that whenever you bring out terrain for battles, that's interspersed with the exploration and the role-playing that you're doing in between games so there's already a variety in what you're doing so your your terrain does not have to be different every single time you use it i love that i love that answer absolutely 100 percent. and you know what i'm going to add to that too it, it doesn't have to be different and honestly it doesn't have to be perfect it can no. be it can be anything it could quite literally be like xps foam painted green that's it that's your like plains tile i know it's not it's not super beautiful to look at but you're still getting across elements of the context that the players are having their encounter in and as you learn new talent and new skills you can make it look better mm -hmm. um if you want to if if you want to you you could just keep using the popsicle stick tent <laughs> like me for as long as you live and uh <laughs> Yeah, it becomes a little bit of a ritual. It comes a, becomes That's a little it. bit of a, like bringing comfort in. Oh, okay, this this is the moment that we're having now. Oh, the tents come out. Okay, like what do we want to do about this time that the tents come out? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's definitely a benefit of using terrain, right? It's it's. I think even over like a battle map or something. A battle map usually when you go and you buy a battle map from a third party publisher or whatever, I feel like the battle maps tend to be pretty specific. Yeah, so using like a battle map or something, I feel like in part because it wasn't something that you had your hands in creating and also because a battle map has that two-dimensionality to it, if you're just using the battle map and you're pulling out the same battle map over and over again, your players might kind of catch on, mm -hmm. right? But if you're pulling out scatter terrain, especially you know when we get to the next section where we talk about building terrain, there, I think there are ways that we can build terrain in such a way that they are usable in a lot of different contexts and in a lot of different ways so that your players kind of can't come to expect the use of that piece of terrain. Um, so you know what, before I dig even deeper, why don't we just <laughs> go right into that and talk about how people uh, can make terrain if they wanted to. Uh, so Rachel, I'm going to throw you a, maybe a basics question first. And then we can work our way into things that are a little bit more complicated. But if I was somebody listening to today's episode of Roleplay Chat and I don't own any tools and I don't know anything about making my own terrain, what would you tell that person and what kind of things could they kind of pick up to get themselves started? Um, my answer would be not much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, Jeremy over at Black Magic Craft on YouTube uh, has a really great video addressing this exact question. I think it's called The Only Thing You Need to Start Making Terrain. Um, awesome. Cool. So yeah, uh, for anyone looking to get into hobby, I'm going to quote him here uh, and say for basic supplies, um, what you need to cut stuff. So utility knife, scissors, ruler, cutting mat. Um, supplies to texture stuff if you want to do that uh, you can rocks you, you can pick up anywhere outside <laughs> scrunched up foil <laughs> pointy things um, supplies to glue stuff a hot glue gun liquid glue mod podge um, supplies to paint stuff and then the stuff uh, being xps foam or a dollar store foam board or heck even cardboard chipboard those thing, kinds of things Almost everything that he identifies or that's on that list, you can buy at the dollar store or source for free just mm -hmm. to get started. So I think the, yeah, 
it, it can look intimidating, especially if uh, your only exposure to terrain is what you see in live plays or, um, you know, bigger terrain crafters on YouTube or Instagram, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but I think the the gist of it is that if you want to get started, you absolutely can. Then, And there are so many resources available to you to help you in that process, in that journey, um, to, yeah, supplies wise. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. A lot of a lot of the tools that people can use are very inexpensive. I think the first the first tool that I bought myself, quote unquote, bought myself was a glue gun. I'm like, <laughs> you know, what? I need a hot glue gun. Walked into the dollar store, bought a two dollar and fifty cent Canadian, so probably like a dollar fifty, whatever, two dollar and fifty cents for a a little crappy glue gun and a little and a dollar for a pack of glue sticks mm -hmm. and i just started gluing cardboard together a hundred percent most of the things that you're gonna need or that you're even gonna want is like in your recycling bin yeah <laughs> yeah honestly i'm like <laughs> diving through my recycling bin for like oh i need i need a toilet paper roll for <laughs> for this next craft so yeah i couldn't agree more um so once people listening have gone and done their dollar store run for some supplies uh and actually, you know what, Rachel, before I get on to my next question, you did talk about um, like foam core, mm, foam board. Yes, I wanted yes. to draw specific attention to that because that's something that I know almost universally in Canada and the US. And I think in the UK too, you can find at dollar stores. Yes. And uh, can you walk us through what that is and why it makes for really good uh, terrain crafting? Yeah. Um, so... Um, foam, like, I, I think the levels would go cardboard is kind of like the base and it's for you. Um, uh, and then foam core, uh, which you can get from dollar store is this really, it's this thin foam board that often has an adhesive paper layer to protect the foam in between. And depending on where you get it from, it can be the style where the paper is easily peelable or a little bit more um, adhered to the foam. But either way, once you remove that paper stuff, uh, the foam that is left in between, it's this like the spongy white stuff that's firm enough on its own to um, give you the structures that you need for whatever you want to build, whether it's a, a dungeon tile or a wall or a roof. Um, but it's also spongy enough where it'll take impressions uh, and it'll take texturing if you want it to represent uh, something like the ground, something like plaster. Uh, so rolling over a, like a scrunched up tinfoil ball or taking some rocks and bashing it into it can mm -hmm. really do wonders for the the appearance of it when you then go to paint it and, and do other things to it. Um, but uh, it's, it's super accessible, the material, and it's thin enough where you can cut it really easily with an X-Acto knife. Um, I haven't tried with scissors, but I imagine that you could do that too. Um, yeah, so it's it's a really, I think, forgiving material to work with uh, in both uh, uh, crafting ability and expense. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Th thanks for that description. I I really like that stuff a lot too, because like you were saying, right, sometimes it has that white, or I think it always has that like white Bristol board or like paper yeah. on, on both sides. And I find that it adds a really fun texture that you can play with, right? Some of it you can peel off if you want to add impressions. Some of it you keep with the paper. So like maybe you're building a sturdy base to something and then you put on, you can like glue on the textured pieces on the outside uh, if, if you wanted to. It, it kind of gives you this versatility that like you were saying, I was at first, I was very intimidated uh, by XPS foam, like that pink insulate it's, it's, it's effectively insulation foam here in canada you go to like a yeah. home depot and you buy a big thing of insulation foam um i was very intimidated by that i did i didn't want to like look silly walking into a home depot to buy like one sheet of that and then have somebody <laughs> looking like why are you only buying one <laughs> what are you what are you doing <laughs> so for a long time i used i used the the card stock uh the, well, now i'm forgetting what it's called but that like that, that dollar board, tree yeah. foam board stuff yeah Anyway, anyway, so yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking out. Um, sweet. And, and now that people kind of know the basics of the equipment that they might need to get started, what are some easy projects that you personally you would recommend for people to, to kind of explore the beauty of terrain making with? Yeah, um, really anything that 
can help you get adjusted to like basics of terrain making. A really good example of that is uh, dungeon or like pavement tiles. Uh, they're a good example because they're simpler to make and they're fairly versatile to use. I think that's the important part is there's no point in making something if you're not going to use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, there's a wealth of resources and tutorials on YouTube as well that show you how to make these, whether you want to make it out of cardboard, a dollar store foam board or XPS foam. So it's super beginner friendly because there's a bunch of different methods so you can absolutely pick what works for you and they're super versatile so you're going to be using them quite frequently in your games whether to represent a room or a city or a dungeon if you're doing a dungeon crawl and because the their dungeon tiles you can build in the grid squares into it mm -hmm. in a way that's aesthetically pleasing and uh, useful for the mechanics of the game um, yeah, so under those and, and under those same parameters of, of what makes a dungeon tile useful, I would say that from there, you can also try making um, pillars. Uh, they, those work great for uses in dungeons, castles, churches, thrones, to add a little bit of a, that 3D element. Um, mm -hmm. And then also you could do rocks and boulders as scatter terrain for um, outdoor encounters. Uh, those, those are things that you can easily do with the supplies listed. You don't need anything fancy for those like a Proxon or <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, I think that's fantastic advice. I think I really want to stick on the piece that you said, make something that's going to be practical for you. You know, if you're, if you're running a game and it's like all high politics and you're never going into a dungeon and you're always in like these social settings. You know what? Maybe making columns is a right call because you can really use those columns in all kinds of like in a ballroom mm -hmm. or in a church or in like the, the throne room, like you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you're yeah, if you're always out and about on a pirate ship, maybe maybe a really cool thing for you to do would be like some kind of like sand tiles for a beach encounter or something i don't know yeah. um also, try, to, for, try to be very thematic i forgot to mention yeah uh, along those lines popsicle sticks popsicle sticks are oh, great yeah. for um yeah if if you're going to be in for some reason, tavern settings or yeah on the docks or on a ship um you can use popsicle sticks and paint to represent the wooden floors yes yes very good very good advice popsicle sticks and like those uh i really like the stir sticks that people use in like yeah, coffee yeah yeah um, those are those combined together just just the right amount of diversity between like the, the chunkier popsicle sticks and the thin <laughs> and the thin stir sticks yes uh, absolutely 100% i think i'm also going to go out here and say make yourself a little crappy tent let's do it <laughs> let's let's get on the let's get on the horse of the little crappy tent again because that thing has seen the most game time out of everything i've made dungeon tiles rock scatter i even made like a boat for my pirate campaign but that that tent i'm telling you it comes out without fail every time they have a rest and i think it's worth making and it was super easy like popsicle sticks again like you said mm -hmm. rachel popsicle sticks and paper towel that's it that's all i needed <laughs> and i mean a lot of glue a lot of mod parts <laughs> Um, so, so 100%, you know what, actually Rachel, something that we didn't talk about and I'm going to circle back real quick is paint. Oh, yes. um, what kind of paint should people consider using when they're doing this? The cheapest that you can find, um, again, the dollar store is a great resource for this terrain, unlike miniature painting is very forgiving when you're using cheaper paints. And in fact, because mm. you're covering so much ground um, with terrain, you don't want to use expensive paints because you're going to be using quite a bit of it. Um, and especially if you take the time to do some texturing, that'll do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, and terrain itself looks impressive enough um, when if you're just going to use a layer of black and then gray and then a lighter gray on top of that to give some depth to what you're mm -hmm. painting. Um, yeah, I, I would say that you don't have to start with much. Like if you're if you just want to try making a dungeon tile, you only need like three colors. Um, and each of the bottles, it'll last you quite a long time as well. Um, and they're like, what, a dollar, a dollar fifty per bottle. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would even say two colors black and white that's it yeah. and then yeah. mix it together um 
Yeah, one hundred percent. And then a bottle of Mod Podge would be the third yes. bottle. Yes, <laughs> so that that would be the one thing, especially working with foam, is some way to finish it off. Because the the reasons for why it can take impressions well is the exact reason for why it might not hold up uh, with mm-hmm. a lot of use. So Mod Podge is great because it's uh, a, a PVA, a liquid glue with a little bit of resin in it that can help um, make your pieces way sturdier and last a long time. Yes, very good advice. So definitely when you're making those first dungeon tiles, just layer on the Mod Podge. Obviously not <laughs> to the point where you're like hiding detail, but it's it's a rock. Like you're if you're painting a rock, you're painting a rock. And you can you can cover up some details and not uh not really make a big impact, I don't think, on the finished product. It'll still look pretty good. Yeah. Um Maybe you're cringing over there, Rachel. I'm sorry if I'm giving bad advice. <laughs> No, it, it, whatever, again, is whatever serves your purpose, right? It, if you're a perfectionist as far as visuals go, chances are you're compromising a lot of your own time. <laughs> so if you mm. don't have a lot of that, then absolutely slathering on the Mod Podge uh, in order to make it more rigid. And if you fill in some of the gaps, but hey, that thing's sticking around for the next three, four, five years. Great. That is totally fine. It's the, the thing about crafting terrain is that it you do it however it serves you to do it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely um all right so we've gotten the foot in the door people have tried doing some terrain now i want to ask you personally rachel what are some of the tools that you've started using in your hobbying that you're super excited about maybe it's like a, a new shifting lands tool for your <laughs> proxon i don't know but what's something that you're like this thing is the best i love it so much because x uh, what would that be i'm i'm gonna go a little bit uh um i was gonna use no i'm, I'm gonna go, go, go a little as bit. <laughs> deep as you want deep cut it's fine let's go the coolest tool you've got that you're the most excited about well the, the coolest tool i've got are usually things that are the most makeshift <laughs> <laughs> because um, you, you mentioned shifting lands and uh, so I have a Proxon wire, um, a hot wire. So it's a machine that a lot of terrain builders use in order to work with XPS foam because it's a very thin wire and you can get handheld versions as well, but it's a very thin wire that allows you to um, divide chunks of this XPS foam like it's butter. It's really mm. wonderful to to wield. <laughs> um, but one a thing about the Proxon is that it can be a little bit finicky as far as getting really accurate cuts. And specifically for me, because I make modular terrain, I need them to be able to sit beside each other well, which means I need mm-hmm. to do quite accurate stuff. Um, but shifting lands is a little bit inaccessible for me because they make all of these accessories for the Proxon to help you make uh, as exact of cuts as you can and intricate cuts like they have pillar templates um they have templates to allow you to make perfect circles but it's really expensive (laughs) um and i think they're based in the uk or in europe somewhere so also the shipping costs you get here i also live in canada so oh cool yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) the cost to get it here is it's also just it adds up so for me the things that i get most excited about is when I can uh, makeshift something that serves Mm, my purpose. Um, And so uh, you might have seen in a couple of videos, when I go to make cuts on my Proxon, uh, where I need to just shave off a large section of the terrain to make it just a little bit uh, um, shorter in terms of height, I have a wooden box (laughs) that that I measured and it happens to be 90 degrees. I just glued uh, a piece of paper on top of that to make it smoother and that is my vertical guide (laughs) perfect perfect so those are the things it's like oh if i can build it and it serves my purpose that's what i get excited about (laughs) (laughs) so you're crafting for your crafting yes yes that's really cool (laughs) i can appreciate that i can really appreciate that i'm i'm currently trying to figure out a way to create like a guide to make circles Cause I'm trying to make like a whole bunch of little carts for like market stalls and like stuff like this. And I hate free handing stuff oh. on my Proxon. <laughs> like 
I, I'm so bad at it. I, it's just not worth even talking about. I'm just, I, I get like, I'm like shaky and I can't do it. <laughs> I want something to make my, and so if I'm shaky and make terrain, you guys listening can do it too. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like, I've used things like bottle caps and like, I tried to like cut out the frills of the bottle cap, but that hasn't worked out or like tin cans and like cut the tin can. But anyway, I I a hundred percent agree with you. There's there's kind of like this beauty to making a tool for yourself for a very specific purpose <laughs> instead of spending like seventy dollars <laughs> for little pieces of wood to cut pillars or whatever. It's, yeah, and that that's one thing that you'll probably find, and I hope that I keep doing in my videos is that yeah, where where there's where there's a mismatch between the end product that you want to get to the end, the final, the finished craft and the tool that you need to get there. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's, it can be a very fun and rewarding process to uh, MacGyver something um, that serves. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's really cool. Um, really quickly. I'm going to answer my own question and say that I'm absolutely in love with my static grass applicator. Um, it's really, really cool. My wife bought it for me for my birthday a couple of years ago, and I tried to MacGyver my own, and it didn't really work out. <laughs> There's a lot of YouTube videos about, like, making your own out of, like, a battery pack and, like, things you can get online for pretty for pretty inexpensive, but it just yeah. didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's one of the like official wargaming scenic ones, whatever it's called, and and it works it works really really well. Um, I will say though, on your channel, you've encouraged people to use a balloon, right? Like it's a regular <laughs> yeah. balloon, and yeah. it's cool. That's a really cool alternative to spending hundreds of dollars. Mm. On... I I yeah. will say like if if you have the means or the ability to to get a static grass applicator. Watching people apply static grass is one of my favorite things to do. Terrain builders, if you are making something and you have a section where you show you're doing the static grass, I will watch mm. that. It's so satisfying. And, Super satisfying. And yeah, and for me, I wanted to be able to achieve that without paying out of pocket the the amount that it takes to get a good static grass applicator. And I, I don't know I don't know where the idea came from you static 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 balloons balloons have static I don't know let's <laughs> yeah. give this a try let's see it may be so I will say that it doesn't quite do like it, it doesn't do nearly as good of a job as a good static grass applicator will but it does a good enough job for the 20 cents that a little balloon costs so <laughs> yeah exactly you, I mean you might as well buy a bag of balloons at the dollar store while you're at it um because a hundred percent, it's so much better than honestly. It's I'm sure that's better than a cheap static grass applicator, like or or equivalent. Um, so you save yourself the heartache of trying to make your own and just buy balloons yeah, instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and there's pretty nice ways to make static grass too that I've experimented with. Just buying like twine, and then cutting it into really small pieces. Mm. You can make yourself something that's very like equivalent to, to, to static grass you can dye it too if you want to get all fancy but even just using brown twine cutting it with scissors really small like a good pair of scissors really small and then fraying it like crazy mm. that that can be a really nice entry point um for for kind of adding grass to a piece i don't yeah. know if it'll stand the, the test of the static or not but it, it can add some texture for sure. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually one thing that I want to say about crafting terrain in general is if it seems intimidating to get into because, oh, well, I got to do this and then I got to make that. There is an element of creating any sort of craft, making crafts, art in any any form that can be really beneficial for your own well-being in that mm. like you take the time, you put in the effort, you have the materials, whatever it is, and you make something and you get to see what you've made as a final product. And that can be super rewarding to being able to even to use that as a, at the table if you choose to go that far. But even just making it to begin with, 
the feedback of your skills and time that you put into this thing and getting to see it at the end can be really beneficial for anyone's mental health as well, not just uh, facilitating gameplay. But um, so I, I will purport uh, ex- exercising creativity uh, anytime, any place. So <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that's great. It's always nice to have like a creative outlet, I find, um, to make things. So yeah, I agree yeah. with you a million percent. Um, before we move on to the next piece, I did want to ask you, Rachel, is there a piece of terrain that you've made that you're really proud of? Uh, and and what is it? And tell us a little bit about about that piece of terrain. Yeah, I um, I th- I ran. I had the privilege of running a two year campaign um, nice. a, a little while ago. And for our final battle, I knew that I wanted to make something that was going to be epic for it. Um, and I had this idea of a floating island, and. I also had the, nice. the privilege of we we had like a month and a half between our second last session and our last session. So I had a plenty of time to make this thing. So I really made it a, a monumental task. It, <laughs> it was going to be a floating island that through the course of the battle was going to split apart. And Whoa. within this tornado of, um, of, of ethereal energy was going to be able to move. <laughs> So, that is so cool. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I was I was really proud of what I was able to do. Um, it took like five XPS foam boards, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the end, and and maybe maybe I will release a, just a showcase video um, in the future. But totally, I, you totally should. Yeah, I, it I'm, was this I'm big, excited already. Big chunk of foam that looked together one island. Um, I also wanted it to be a surprise that it could break apart. So mm. there, there were like visually cracks in it, but it just looked like, oh, because the, the island was ele- elevated yeah, from the it's, ground. Yeah, it's old and stuff. Yeah. And then halfway through, I, what I had done is after I made the whole thing, I had cut out pieces where I, I had adhered them with magnets and then could take them apart. Awesome. And I had a lazy Susan that everything else was on. I had two lazy Susans, so one of them could turn counter to the other. And <laughs> acrylic rods that I'd put in. Yeah, it was a super elaborate piece, but yeah, so worth it um, to see cool. the reactions of the players and th- how dynamic they were in terms of um, moving their character from place to place and what they wanted to do from where. So yeah, it, it was really cool. That is so cool. I definitely want to see this, <laughs> this thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm I, I'm very impressed. That's so neat. Um, and magnets, yeah, magnets are are a secret weapon. I feel, hey, especially in in this in this special area of terrain making where we're making modular things. Uh, and that's something that you do a lot on your YouTube channel. Why is it that you choose to make your terrain modular? What kind of benefits do you feel like that brings to? Uh, to, to the use of the terrain in your games. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing with modular terrain and specifically modular terrain with XPS foam is that foam is really light. <laughs> and so um, when you have a bunch of pieces that you want to put together, they can be a little bit unstable. Uh, in terms of using the terrain, it is can be kind of frustrating if you just have a bunch of foam pieces and a character, a, per, a player goes to put their character on it and then, oh, oops, they've pushed it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, what I, uh, I started watching RP Archive um, and I, yeah, if you haven't watched my videos, you will quickly learn how many of his videos I've watched. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, he, he came up with this ingenious way to Um, have everything fixed together uh, in a way that is stable and flexible that involves magnets because if Mm. all of the pieces are adhered together then you can't really push it around because yeah it it becomes a big mass uh, that is much more stable Um, 
And their magnets are not by far not the only way to do this. A lot of people, you can uh, add uh, counterweights or just weights on the bottom of your pieces so that they're mm -hmm. more stable and they don't have to be fixed to each other. Um, uh, Wylox Armory also has a way of putting the pieces together using just uh, a chipboard slot at the bottom of his tiles. Uh, and I think he just uses cardboard as well. Um, so there are many different ways of doing it. I like mm -hmm. magnets because I like tediousness <laughs> and, and, um, uh, the exactness of putting, putting magnets in the spots where they line up nicely with each other. So one thing I will say is that using magnets may not be the most beginner friendly way to get into modular terrain and by no means are they necessary to get into it. Um, it is definitely for the person who wants that, uh, wants that to be a part of their system. And mm -hmm. if you do get into the game, there are so many benefits to the way that um, magnets can be used in scattered terrain, in putting your tiles together, um, in uh, like creating mountain cliff faces where or, or walls where you can adhere little accessories to the walls because you've got wires in them. I haven't gone that far, but like mm -hmm, there, mm -hmm. there's a, a deep, deep well of how you can use magnets with modular terrain. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Um, and while we're on the topic of you know how to use terrain why don't we segue into that topic of conversation because i think that while it can be its own therapeutic exercise and it can be a lot of fun to make terrain for a table or just to make terrain for yourself and have it sit in a in a bookshelf and wait for the opportune moment <laughs> to use it like i have perhaps done um <laughs> <laughs> i think that when you do pull the terrain out on the table it can sometimes take some getting used to. So why don't we share some of our strategies for, for, for using terrain? And first, I'd like to ask you, Rachel, why is it that there is maybe a little bit of a learning curve for using terrain when we're used to using other tools like a whiteboard or a battle map or stuff like that? Yeah, I, I would say that, again, it's it's definitely dependent on the complexity of your encounter um, for one i think the reason why people find it difficult to get in the mindset of using terrain um, is one uh, encounters often come up on the fly so mm -hmm. um, in those moments where you're under the pressure of trying to like uh, figure out your enemies initial all this kind of stuff to then figure out terrain is another layer um, be so you have to one be familiar with your own terrain library and familiar to the extent where you also know what limitations you have depending because maybe you've just gotten into the hobby um, and so your library isn't that big yet or maybe you're in a place narratively where you weren't expecting a battle and so maybe your terrain doesn't quite match up where you are mm -hmm. um, so those moments can be hard to whip together an accurate battlefield and i think that's where the struggle comes from is where you're trying to um, use terrain effectively on the fly uh, to match what you have physically in front of you and what you have envisioned in your mind. Um, so that that's where I think the struggle is generated. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah, I can definitely agree with what you're saying, Rachel. I think definitely with the impromptu nature of the game, right? You you definitely find yourself sometimes in situations where the players decide to run after a bandit that they encountered on the road and they successfully track them when you didn't think that they would be able to. And now <laughs> they're in the bandit camp that you had to invent live on, you know, on site having to, you know, go to the basement to pull out your, your terrain and build that battle map out live can be tricky. It, it can kind of slow the game down too, or it can kind of ruin the pace of the game. Um, do you have any strategies that people can use to overcome perhaps some of these challenges yeah. when they're, you know, faced with them? Yeah, I would say, and here's where we're going to get into the gray zone of, of this polarization. Sometimes don't use terrain. 
(laughs) (laughs) Um, Knowing when it's appropriate to use it um, is what's going to make the times when you do choose to use it excellent. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, and and again, there are a ton of different tools. Terrain is just one of them. You know, maybe it's more appropriate to use a battle mat to to illustrate the battlefield, um, just to get the spacing um, a little bit easier for everyone to envision. And hey, theater of the mind. Sometimes with mm-hmm. the most impromptu battles that you're not prepared for, yeah, that's a tool available to you. Theater of the mind, go for that. Um, especially if it's a battle on the fly. Uh, just because you make or you have terrain does not mean you have to use it every single time. And I actually find that yeah, the whole wheelhouse of, of running battles uh, makes the use and appearance of when I bring out the terrain much more special and exciting. Yeah. Oh, my God. Preach on. I think that's the perfect answer. Um, can we can we dig in on those moments where it does make where you know, where the terrain is really exciting? What would be in your head if you had a checklist of kind of the things, the moments that are ripe for terrain to be used? What would those kinds of. Uh, what kind of, what would those moments be in your experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, I so this is going to touch into one of the questions, rapid fire questions you asked me earlier, um, whether I am more narratively driven or sandbox. Uh, mm-hmm. The reason I say both, and I Brennan Lee Mulligan uh, illustrated this in the most beautiful way. I write all of I do all of my own world building. And the mm-hmm. benefit of that is that I get to integrate all of the characters' backstories as the world. So yes, we are on a sort of linear path, but it's a linear path that is created by the players and it's the world that they helped me build. So of course they're going to want to go down this path because that's what their character wanted. That's mm-hmm. you know that's the goal that we're going for. And the benefit of that, Uh, It's not railroading because they created the rails. (laughs) Um, The benefit of that is that I have the foresight for what encounters might be coming down the pipeline. So if I know that they've been pursuing um, this particular enemy or they're going into this particular area where there's the potential of certain enemies, I can plan for that ahead of time. And so... um, whether you're following a module or you're doing your own world building, um, when you're deciding on what enemies are going to be present in the battle, pre-building and pre-planning the terrain is going to elevate how your enemies are able to manipulate that battlefield because of the thought mm-hmm. that you put into uh, beforehand putting it all together. Um, and I, th- I think it's really cool having not just hard-hitting enemies, but smart enemies. Um, it can be really exciting for the players to encounter. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a piece of me too as a terrain crafter where I feel a huge amount of pride over the work that I put into these sets for the players. And I find it hugely rewarding to see how they interact with it. And so when I choose to bring it out, I find that that excitement makes me a better DM as well. So all of that kind of culminating, the foresight, um, the putting it together, uh, having it in a separate room, and then like oh, mm-hmm. taking out the complete set and how, oh God, that's what we're going to play on? Okay, I'm going to be here, right? There's there's that like yeah. hub of excitement that I find um, really uh, gives change changes the pace in a really favorable way yeah a hundred percent i i think too like you're saying having the foresight is something that any game master you know any game master whether they're using terrain or not if you envision a battle between a player and their nemesis that they have been like foreshadowing for a very long time and they've been like illustrating this concept that they want to have this face off against their nemesis that's that's gonna happen like you you as a game master are gonna do everything in your power to make that situation happen for your players and if you happen to be a crafter and you want to create this really cool arena fight for them to have that face off in or, or whatever it is like you know that big finale battle that you're talking about in your floating island that, that rips <laughs> apart These are set pieces that you have in your mind as a game master anyway. And, you know, you're just going to use your your toolbox as a crafter, I think, to help elevate that to a new level. I I think, too, the the thing that you touched on about bringing it out Mm 
mm. all already pre-constructed, yes. I think is a really, really good way to kind of you build it out. And then if it becomes necessary to pull out tonight or the next night or whenever, whenever it becomes relevant, that's a really good way to avoid having the game slow down and have you need to build it all out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will say that there's there's really only one time that I can remember choosing to use terrain for an on-the-fly battle. And it, it wasn't a battle that I didn't see coming. I just didn't know we were going to get there at this session. Mm-hmm. So one one thing, if you really do want to be able to use terrain, but you need the time to put it together, you can take a little break. Say like, oh, um, let's take a fiver. Um, Because also that can help refresh the energy because you've got, it's not like you're taking a break because you're tired. You're taking a break in anticipation for something. And so that can give the players a chance to reset or to like stir, uh, like strategize. Okay, well, if this is what's coming up, what are we going to do? What if this is there? Right. And they can have that moment uh, while you are uh, running down to your basement, scrambling to <laughs> scrambling to put the battlefield together. Um, but even putting it together in front of them can also be a really connecting experience because then there's an increased appreciation for the craft, seeing mm. um, the process, not just the final product. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. I I never consider that. I I I like keeping my my stuff behind the curtain. But that's, <laughs> there there's definitely I think a benefit to doing something like that, or even like enlisting your players' help. Yeah. In, in building the terrain, I find that. So one thing that I really like to do, and I'm gonna try to segue it back into this, but one thing that I really like to do is I like to end a lot of my games on cliffhangers, mm-hmm. and most of the time those cliffhangers are not predetermined you know it's based on the pace of the game and where my players are going i come up with some bombastic thing that happens even if i don't know why it's happened and then i tell myself that i have two weeks to figure it out (laughs) (laughs) Um, so one thing that happened very recently was my party was out on the road they were traveling with a group of like merchants and then i had the merchants realize that in the back of their caravan, there was a a skaven, a rat person, just like sleeping unconscious in the back of the caravan. And they find him and freak out. And that was where the game, like, I'm like, okay, done. We're done. We're going to figure out what's going on next time. Yeah. So that gave me this, uh, this perfect situation where I'm like, the next game, I'm going to start with everything laid out on the table. Like as people arrive in my house, they're going to see the the pieces of terrain with the cart, with the minis, with everything. And I've never had a game start on time except for that one because the, <laughs> everyone was so excited to be like, "Let's go. Let's start playing. No chitter chatter. We're going to we're going to figure out what's going on." And they didn't start with combat. They were like talking to the, trying to wake up the Skaven and talk to him. And then he freaked out and then a bunch of Skaven attack. But, you know, they could have very easily avoided that conflict altogether. They could have bargained with him. Anyway, my point being that that's that was one way for me to kind of adjust to this concept of having the players have to wait for me to set up the terrain or mm. even pulling it out. It was just already there. They figured it out. Um, and then I was able to recycle it because after excuse me, after that combat was done, I kind of rejigged it really quickly. And then I pulled out my trusted tent and I'm like, where are you guys, where are you guys setting up camp tonight? And there was the whole big like line of terrain with the scatter and the rocks and stuff. And they had fun kind of engaging with it in a way that felt strategic to them. Like if, if we get attacked in the night, what's the best spot for our tent to be? Um, and that would be something that the characters would probably be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Cool, 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 cool. I so I really appreciate those answers, Rachel. I think that there's a lot of really neat places where terrain can shine, and your your advice of not always using it <laughs> is perfect. Um, I think we covered a few of the scenarios where it's not suitable. Things like impromptu battles, uh, things that your library of of terrain doesn't exactly fit the the situation that's given. Are there other situations that you can think of where you might advise against using terrain because of, you know, the complexity of the situation. What would those situations be if there are others? I I think the, 
the things that I'm thinking of are kind of subsections of of okay. what we've previously discussed. But like, if it if it's a more like trivial battle, like it's, it's a small scuffle, um, then those those kinds of things I don't think merit terrain. Where where you can that's for for everything that uh, theater of, of the mind um, is good for. Um, it is a lot simpler to imagine how your character interacts with the enemy when it's smaller scale right mm -hmm. um if it's if you're yeah chasing after the thief in a back alley okay well it's a it's a runway of alley there's one thief and it right it's easier to imagine those kinds of things um so for smaller scuffles i would say terrain probably not appropriate um there's no need to bring out all of that terrain in the amount of time that it would take you to finish the battle <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> um and um yeah i i think those are those are the kind of the times uh like super on the fly smaller battles uh yeah they don't they don't require the terrain yeah i think that makes sense i mean terrain does kind of elevate the game does kind of add emphasis so if there's a situation that you don't want to be adding emphasis in don't don't worry about it um i think it's also really fun to use terrain in different ways like don't always pull out or for me personally i try not to only pull out terrain for combat because then i i train my players to mm. think that as soon as they see the terrain that they're rolling for initiative or that they're getting their weapons out and they're you know they're, they're going to be fighting so i think i don't know if this totally answers my own question or not <laughs> but i definitely think that using terrain in a variety of ways can be fun Using terrain for the first time in like a social context, for instance, maybe it's like a ball or a big dinner and you've got the terrain out because you want to really emphasize how important this dinner is and there's people there with really high social standing and you can have these like a social encounter where you're talking to different characters and there's a time limit and you can't get to everybody so you got to pick and choose your relationships wisely or whatever it is. But if you were to do that after 10 fights on terrain... Your players are going to pull out their weapons and fight the <laughs> diplomats right off the bat. And, <laughs> and that's maybe not what you wanted them to do. Or, or at least you wanted them to consider other options first. So mm. definitely, definitely try yeah. not to use your terrain always in the same scenarios. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it sounds like like where wherever terrain is useful for you in your game, use it mm -hmm. then. You know, if, yeah, for, for social encounters, if, if it's the the idea that it's a big place um like dungeon crawls for example you can use terrain for dungeon crawls um just to illustrate where you started and where you're going it doesn't have to be a battle it's just to keep track of okay well we just explored this room where is this place in relation to that to yeah mm -hmm. so it can illustrate layout yeah absolutely absolutely um I actually had a really fun thing happen not too long ago in one of my games where one of my players decided that they wanted to do like a mini map. Um, so while they were exploring a dungeon, I was using, it was my first time using uh, a super tile or a mega tile or whatever they're called. It was like, it's like a big circular tile on, uh, on a lazy Susan. Oh yeah. And then I would just put scatter terrain on it and be like, look, this is the shape of the room. And then there's a monster and there's like some columns or, Oh, there's there's like a water feature here so i'd pull out like a little water fountain or whatever and like that's that's the water feature so instead of actually mapping out the dungeon we were only using the super tile when the players were in a situation where it was called upon to use a super tile for like combat or exploration exploring like a big space and on the side on the whiteboard my players were actually drawing out like oh we turned left <laughs> from this room to that room and they were kind of creating like their own mini map of yeah. the space so i thought that was really fun um and ever since they've done that they've done it every time so and anyway i don't know where i was going with that story nice. but um, <laughs> <laughs> another way to use terrain <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly um so so rachel one one thing about terrain that i think is probably one of its biggest downfalls or at least for me is versatility I find that terrain, I, I personally often find myself in a situation where I make something, I use it like maybe twice, 
and then it disappears and I forget I have it in the first place. Or maybe I don't forget I have it, but like it, I find it hard to bring it forward and use again in like another context. So I'd like to ask you if there's anything that, you know, you've made in your collection. This may be a two-parter. Are there things that you've made in your collection that you feel like are very versatile and people should start with creating those those kinds of pieces so that they can use them a lot? And or are there strategies that you can employ when you're constructing your terrain pieces in the first place that can um, kind of encourage this reuse of of terrain pieces and maybe this is where the modularity comes in uh, so i'll leave it up to you mm -hmm. um what kind of what kind of direction you want to take this question but uh, yeah. yeah yeah i do find that um it when you have specific encounters in mind it can be easy to sort of as a crafter tunnel vision on mm -hmm. oh, i want to make something that looks exactly the way that I have it in my mind and the compromise being, uh, you know, flexibility or, or, or the ability to use it at all after the fact. My floating island is a really great example of that. I've used it <laughs> once and once only. <laughs> um, but that being said, I find the mentality that I have and the reason why I choose modular terrain is because I always want to have in mind how I'm going to use it for the upcoming encounter and how I can continue to use it afterward. Mm. So wherever the players are, where we're going to have a battle, I think of, okay, what is this? What does the scene look like in general? Um, if it's, they're camping out in a forest. Okay. The forest is the general scene. Um, maybe there are specifics that I want in this area, like there's a big fallen over tree that's relevant mm. to the story, but in general, it's a forest. So that's where I'm going to build what I'm going to have in mind when I'm building is it suits the scene and it's a general forest that I can use in the future. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so with, especially if you choose a system for modularity, then you always have a basis of um, what the structure of your tiles is, are going to look like. Um, and whether in a lot of ways, I would say scatter terrain is modular because uh, you're making a big rock that you can place in the middle of mm -hmm. this forest, but also on this mountainside, but also um, in this field, but also, you know, so um terrain that way is, is very versatile when you can uh, put it together into a whole scene and take it apart to store away nicely. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I would say for um, building in terms of uh, uh, for the short term and the long term for um, what are the most versatile pieces? I would say, um, and I'm going to toot my own horn. My wilderness tile set, ha ha ha. Um, what the thing which that is I... super cool, by the way. I really <laughs> like the I really like the, the tile set. I haven't I have yet to make wilderness tiles, so that I'm I'm definitely gonna be watching your video like over and over again as I do it to make sure that I do it uh, in a similar way because yeah. I, I really like that. But yes, please, please. Yeah. Um. I so what that's what I like about uh, that. I I built that with the idea in mind that it wasn't just going to be scrublands. It wasn't just going to be planes. I wanted it to be the base for a forest if I needed it. I wanted it to be the base for a swamp if I need it. Um, something that visually can match in all of those environments. So mm -hmm. the more generalized you can make your terrain appear, the more settings you're going to be able to use it for. Um, and again, that's where uh, the, the verbal descriptions so come into play is these are visual representations that are generic enough to suit these, these scenarios. And it's your verbal description that is going to make it fit for this specific scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and then for like indoor stuff, again, the dungeon tiles huge uh, in terms of versatility you can use those uh in for a dungeon crawl for a city for a, a inside a building um yeah absolutely absolutely i think yeah the tiles are a good place to start too because you put them down and that's it i i'll also kind of talk about the scatter i think scatter terrain is super useful i have lately found myself using the scatter terrain more than using my tile sets because i've just 
love the idea of being able to take a whiteboard marker and just like scribble something on to be the physical manifestation of an idea that somebody at my table has come up with. I, I often play games. My favorite system to run is the Fate Core system, which is a system that allows players to create aspects in a space collectively before they enter it. So you can be like, we're in a ballroom tonight. I, I keep going back to a ballroom. I'm sorry, I don't know why that's stuck in my head. We're going to a ballroom tonight and you ask the table, like, what is this ballroom like? And someone might say, it's dimly lit. Okay, so maybe there's like big curtains and they're closed and they're, there's like small candles spread out that dimly light it. Someone else will say, it's very well polished and cleaned. And so maybe that aspect can be called upon later to have like custodial staff be present as they're cleaning it it, it so it, it hearkens this like collaborative essence of creation which makes terrain <laughs> use of terrain very complicated mm. um at least f for me personally so oftentimes if i were to run this ballroom i would pull out the whiteboard i would draw the ballroom out in whiteboard uh, with the whiteboard and the marker but then I would have things like the columns or maybe the candles or like a, a, an elevated spot where there's like a king and a queen sitting down. That would be the terrain. But then I would still have the whiteboard for me to be able to like scribble stuff on as my players come up with it. Um, so I think the versatility, like you were saying earlier, Rachel, is dependent on how you use it. Yeah. How you, you know, how you play your game. If you find yourself doing a lot of dungeon crawls and you're going to you're going to do that till the end of time, maybe dungeon tiles is the way to go. Like that's going to be what's going to see the most light uh, in your game. Mm -hmm. but yeah, 100 percent. Speaking of the way we play our game, Rachel, I think it's time now for us to segue into the special secret club of the roleplay chat Patreon, where we're going to talk about how we prepare our games and I'd like to pick your brain a little bit about how you use terrain and budget that into your prep time also. But um, but yeah, so everybody listening, we're going to see you on the other side if you're not a Patreon subscriber. If you So here we are. We talked for a long time about terrain. And I'm sorry, it's been, it's been a long time. Um, so before we wrap up our conversation, I wanted to give you the opportunity to do kind of two things. First to have the floor to talk about anything terrain related that we didn't get a chance to cover today. If there's something that's kind of sticking in the back of your mind that you wanted to make sure that the listeners of Roleplay Shot have uh, that information, now's a great chance to do it. And then once you've had your closing remarks, I also wanted to offer you the opportunity to remind everybody where they can listen to your YouTube series, where they can find any of your other content and where they can subscribe and follow you on social media. Yeah, um, I think I, it's hard to find a nook that we didn't discuss today. <laughs> but uh, if there's anything that I can maybe like reemphasize too, it's it, mm -hmm. that terrain, like terrain crafting, um, like especially making the terrain and choosing to embark on that journey can be hugely rewarding. Um, there, There's something about seeing your players and, and your minis visually in front of you where you get this feedback of the impact that your character has on the battlefield where you know you take out an enemy and they're gone you take them off the board mm -hmm. and so terrain i think really facilitates that and if that is the journey for you then there's a wealth of resources available to you to make that journey easier the barriers to entry uh, hopefully are low in terms of uh, what you actually need to start. And as far as skill level goes, any way that you want to start, you do not have to be perfect at any of this um, to begin with. Uh, it is something that I think will come with time um, and with practice. Nobody is, I think, good at something that they haven't tried before <laughs> right off the bat. So don't be discouraged um, at, at your first attempts at anything. It's a journey. Um, and if, I think if you find pieces of it that you enjoy and that maybe you come to love, that it will elevate your game experience and elevate your life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's 
I, I agree with you. I think especially that part about not necessarily needing it to be perfect right away. I think regardless, your players are going to be grateful of any efforts that you do to make physical representations of your game. I have this memory where I put little tables out on a on a battle map, and that was the only piece of terrain. You know, it was a it was a whiteboard, and we drew out a, a tavern, and I put out some tables. And when a fight broke loose, and one of the NPCs pushed over the table, and I actually flipped the table <laughs> over on its side. My players were like, oh my god, that's cover. And I was like, yeah, isn't that cool? And so like that moment was um, one of those moments where I was like, okay, I'm making a bunch of terrain now. Like, this is so <laughs> awesome. I want to replicate this this, this wonder in my players every single time. So I, I think people listening should give it a try. But like you're saying, Rachel, it doesn't have to be perfect the first time. Probably won't be perfect the first time. Um but it's also a lot easier than you think. I, I I feel like a lot of folks get this idea that you have to be like master crafters to do terrain. And I think perhaps you do if you want to make really high level stuff. But um, for, for, for the layman, for somebody who's doing something just pretty basic for their table, like me, I don't have to be that good at it. And I don't need all the fancy tools that I spend my money on unwisely, <laughs> but I still do anyway because they're fun. But, <laughs> but anyway. yeah, I, I think it is easy to be discouraged if all you do is watch, you know, the goats on YouTube who have been making terrain for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. um, like there's, you don't need to compare yourself to that level. Like start where you want to start um, and, and you'll get there if you want to to get there that's it that's it exactly all right well rachel thank you so much for being here to talk to me about terrain can you let us know where the listeners of roleplay chat can come and and find all of your other wonderful advice uh, on socials and on youtube and all that good stuff Yes, yeah. Um, the main place you're going to find me is YouTube. Uh, I am working on building up a library. Uh, <laughs> I, I hit it kind of hard out of the gate, so I'm, so I'm sorry that there's not more there. <laughs> um, but I, you can find me at Rachel, R-A-E. C H E L does, um, and the title Rachel Does Wonders. Uh, so that's where I am on YouTube. Uh, you can find me on Instagram as well. Uh, I've been going on a, a little uh, miniature adventure showcasing the terrain there in a way that you won't find on YouTube. Um, and I just launched a Patreon uh, not too long ago. So uh, if you feel like supporting a non bearded fellow in this community, <laughs> <laughs> I would love, I would love for that, and I will, I will try to um, incorporate uh, materials that you wouldn't find on the other platforms there. Awesome, yeah, no, I and I want to definitely echo that people should definitely go check out Rachel's content. I think you're doing some really cool stuff on YouTube and on Instagram, and I think that there's only more cool stuff to come. But please take your time, Rachel. <laughs> Don't burn out. Seriously. Do it at your own pace because I know that creative urge to just like make a bunch of cool stuff all the time and to like feed the algorithm. Don't do it. Do your own thing. We'll be here to support you. You got this. And uh, and yeah, so thank you, Rachel, for being here. This has been a wonderful conversation. And I think we can call it a chat. Thank you very much for having me. It was awesome. And I loved talking train with you and hopefully... Hopefully we converted some people. Yes, that's the plan. That's the plan. And as always, thank you to The Mill's wonderful works for her support as a patron of Roleplay Chat. If you'd like to have your name shouted out at the end of every episode, go look for the Patreon link in the show notes for today's episode and support the show. You'll also get access to the extended episodes. And last but not least, I'd like to say thank you to PocketBard for allowing me to use their music in the intro and outro of today's episode. 